The word gospel translates to news that brings joy. But this isn't just any news. A gospel is news that changes a life forever. After being invaded and enslaved by Persia, Greece won two decisive battles at Marathon and Solnus. The Greeks sent out heralds, also called evangelists, to proclaim the good news to the cities. We have fought for you, we have won, and now you're no longer slaves, you're free. The reality is that we are all slaves, slaves to sin and slaves to death. We are slaves in need of good news. Enter Jesus, God's Son, fully God, fully man, bringing news that would change our lives forever. His news was this, I am the divine, come to you to do what you could not do for yourself. I will take what you deserve so you can have what I deserve. You have no idea how much it will cost me, but you also cannot imagine the depths of my love for you. It is a gift that I give freely, so repent. Repent from all the ways you've run from me and follow me. Follow me because I am the only way to eternal life. Follow me because I'm the savior you've been looking for. Follow me because I have authority over everything, yet I have humbled myself for you. Follow me because I died on a cross for you, because I'm your true love and your true life. This is my good news for you. This is my gospel that you have been saved by grace and that you are slaves no more. And that is the gospel that we proclaim here week in and week out, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Seth, thanks for praying for us today that heartfelt, moving prayer that you prayed in the Spirit of God. And thanks for reminding us in your prayer that there are no perfect people in this building today. I think some people have a misconception of church. They think church is made up of people who are perfected, people who have it all together. But that's really not the case. There's not a person here today that's perfect, not a person here today that has everything together. And that's okay, because God meets us where we are. God doesn't meet us where we should be. God meets us where we are, and he can change our lives. He can transform our lives. And so as I look out upon this audience today, I'm looking at an imperfect body. I'm looking at imperfect people. And one thing I know about all of you is that you have problems. It may not be you yourself. It may be a family member. It may be a child or a grandchild. But I'm looking at people who have problems. We, we all face problems in life. It reminds me of a quote from uh, Samuel Shoemaker he once said, every man has a problem, is a problem, or lives with a problem. Can you say amen to that? Amen. <laughs> we all have our problems in life, and yet some people have major problems, major spiritual problems, major psychological problems, major problems in their life where they feel hopeless and, and helpless. And maybe that's you today, or maybe you know someone today that just feels overwhelmed by life and they feel hopeless today. They feel like there's no way out. Uh, some people, this leads them to suicide. And you could even be here today and be wrestling with suicidal thoughts, thinking about taking your own life. Let me say to you that if you ever think about taking your own life, and you ever think about taking your life because you feel like uh, you, you don't deserve to live or, or there's nothing that you can contribute to society or that God says that you're worthless, let me say to you, God would never speak to you in that way. And if you're ever feeling those thoughts and thinking in that way, that's the devil speaking to you. And the devil wants you to take your life. And the devil wants you to ruin your life. And suicide is not the answer. Suicide is just going to bring all kinds of problems for your family and the loved ones that are left behind as they try to put the pieces together. God doesn't want you to take your life. God wants to save your life. Amen. And he can. Amen. He can save your life. You can have a new beginning today. You can have hope and joy. God can give that to you. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a story of a man in the New Testament that was demon-possessed, a man whose life was hopeless, a man whose life was helpless, a man that could not even live among society. He was isolated from society. 
And what we're going to see is that no one could help this man. Many tried. No one in the community could help him. No religious person could help him. He was a man that was hopeless and helpless. But then Jesus stepped into his world and stepped into his life and did for him what no one else could do. No institution could do, no, no religious body could do, no community help could do. Jesus stepped into his life and did for him what no one else could do. He set him free. And this man, for the first time in his life, was saved in his right mind, delivered, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I want to say to you today, if he could do it for this man, he can do it for any man. Amen. That's how... That's how much this man was under the control of the evil one. If he could save him, then he could save anyone that's here today. So if you have your Bible, take it and turn over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. And we've been going through Luke's Gospel looking at the theme of salvation. And, and the word salvation means deliverance. And we're going to talk today about a mighty deliverance, how this man was mightily saved and delivered from the possession of, of demons. And what you're going to notice is this man was a Gentile. Jesus goes into a region. This is not a Jewish region. He goes outside of Palestine, and he goes into a Gentile region. And this is one of the heartbeats of Luke. Remember, I think I told you in my first message in this series that Luke is the only Gentile author of the New Testament, the only non-Jewish author of the New Testament. And as a Gentile, he had a passion for this, and he wanted all the world to know that Jesus was not just a Savior for Jewish people, but he was a Savior for all people, all races. And so he reminds us that there was a moment in Jesus' life when he stepped out of Palestine and went into the Gentile region and into the Gentile world and set this man free. And that's why at the end of Matthew, he says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations because God loves all people and he wants us to share his gospel with them. So look with me, Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you... Do not torment me, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him, he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. The abyss would be a place of confinement where they would be held until, until eternal punishment. It says in verse 32, Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. What a remarkable, powerful story. And again, if, if Jesus could set this man free, he can set any man free. And as we go through this story today, I want to build it around three basic points. The problem, the power, and the proclamation. 
The problem, the power, and the proclamation. Of course, this man's problem was that he was demon-possessed. Now, I realize we live in an age where some people don't believe in demon possession or don't even believe in demons, don't even believe in Satan. I don't really understand that. Even people who say they believe in God, there, there are people who will say, I believe in God, but I don't believe in the devil. Well, there's just as much proof in the world of the work of Satan as there is the work of God, right? So if you say, well, I believe in God because I see his handiwork, well, I can also say I believe in the devil because I also see his handiwork. And I see all of the tragedy and the evil and the fighting and the wars. And as I see that, I see the fingerprints of the evil one. I believe in the devil. And I believe he is a being that is purely evil. He's called the evil one. Now, we've met people who are evil. But it's hard to think of someone being purely evil, nothing but evil. Satan is nothing but evil, and his intent is to destroy, and his intent is to mock God and to blaspheme God, and his intent is to separate you from God, to destroy your life. He's after you. He's after your family. He's after your spiritual life. He's after, after your reputation. He is your sworn enemy. And he's your enemy because he's the enemy of God. Fundamentally, Satan is the enemy of God. He hates God. He does not willingly submit to God. And the reason he hates you is because he hates God. And the reason he hates you is you're made in the image of God. He sees God in you. And he hates you because he hates God. And he's against you. And so I do believe in the devil. And I believe in demon possession. I think it's a reality. Now, I think we need to be careful here because we don't want to say that every problem a person has is demon possession. You can have a spiritual problem and not be demon possession. You can have a psychological problem and it not be demon possession. Some people, they just have psychological problems and it's not necessarily that they're demon possessed. I do think at times it can overlap. But you don't want to call everything that happens in a person's life demon possession and yet... I do believe there are times when a person is demon-possessed. And that's not just that they're influenced by Satan. That's not just that they're lost and under the authority of Satan. To be demon-possessed means that a demon or multiple demons have entered into your life and completely taken over your personality. They are ruling your life. They are directing your life. And in the Bible, we see many examples in the Gospels of demon possession. I believe it can still happen today. I believe it does. Now, you say, well, how do I know if it's demon possession? How do I know if it's not just a psychological problem or a spiritual problem? How do I know if it's actually demon possession? Well, I think we see some characteristics in this text that will help us to be able to diagnose this. One thing you notice about this man who was demon-possessed, he had extraordinary strength. Did you notice that they would bind him with chains and he was able to break the shackles? This is not something you could do in human strength. He had extraordinary strength. And when someone is demon-possessed, there's a strength and a power that they have that is beyond the physical realm. There is a power in the demonic. Now, it's not as great as God's, of course. It's no match for God. But there is power in the demonic world. And this man had extraordinary power. And when you see someone like that, it could be demon possession. I think another characteristic we see in this text is there was a recognition of who Jesus is. He immediately knew him. Now, listen, he's in a Gentile region. And Jesus has done his ministry in Palestine. And so we don't even know if this man had ever heard of Jesus before. And he walks into this Gentile region and immediately he recognized Jesus and says, What have you to do with me, son of the most high God? Let me tell you, demons know who Jesus is. They immediately recognize the Son of God. And I believe they recognize those who belong to the Son of God and who believe in the Son of God. 
And so if there's a recognition of who Jesus is and a recognition that you're a follower of Jesus and a resistance to you because that you're following Jesus, that could be a clear sign of demon possession. Third characteristic we see here is that he lived an isolated and self-destructive lifestyle. He wanted nothing to do with people. He was out in the desert, living in the tombs, fascination with death, living among the tombs. The, the Bible even says he was naked. And in Mark, Mark 5, it says he would cut himself with stones. This was a man who lived a, an isolated and self-destructive lifestyle. Do you know anyone like that today? They just want to isolate themselves from everyone else, and they have a self-destructive lifestyle. They're bent on their own self-destruction. And then a fourth characteristic is his speech was actually taken over by Satan. When this man spoke, it was not him that was speaking. It was Satan speaking through him. And it was Satan had taken over his tongue, had taken over his personality. And Satan said through him, the demon said through him, don't send us into the abyss. That wasn't that man speaking. We don't know that for sure. But by saying my name is Legion and a legion was 6,000 soldiers, this, this means this man had multiple demons in his life. Hundreds of demons, maybe thousands of demons that had inhabited his life and his personality. We know in, in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, we, we saw this, I believe, last week. Mary Magdalene, she had seven demons that had been cast out of her. And here's a man that has multiple demons, more than seven, hundreds of demons, maybe thousands of demons. He was a wild man, lived among the tombs, isolated from society, self-destructive lifestyle. Chains could not bind him, bounding with chains that would would restrict any normal human being, and yet he would break them freely. And yet we learn he could break the physical chains that bound him, but he could not break the spiritual chains that had him bound. You see, he was chained himself, chained and controlled by the evil one. He could not set himself free, but Jesus came along, and Jesus was able to set him free. Let me ask you, do you know of anyone that's under the control of the devil? Maybe they're demon-possessed, maybe they're not. But even if they're not demon-possessed, do you know of anyone that the devil is influencing their life and wreaking havoc in their life? Maybe they're addicted to drugs. Maybe they have a problem with pornography. Maybe they continually hurt themselves and hurt other people, and there's such major problems in their life, you know it's the work of the evil one. We need to pray for those people because mom and dad and grandparents and husbands and wives, you can't help them on your own. When someone is being influenced by the devil in this way, you just don't reason someone out of this. You just don't sit them down and have a conversation and reason them out of this. This is the work of Jesus Christ that will step into their life and arrest their life and take a hold of their life and free them from the power of the enemy. I don't have that power. Not in myself. You don't have that power. We have to pray and pray that God would set them free. You see, the devil is real. Look at 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. This is written to believers. You need to be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. What an image of the devil. They say out in the wild that you can hear the roar of a lion up to six or seven miles away. The mighty roar of a lion. And the Bible says that the devil is like a roaring lion just waiting to pounce upon your life. And could you imagine being in a cage or being out in the wild with a lion? He would absolutely overwhelm and destroy you. Take your life. That's what Satan wants to do. Beastly, destructive, malevolent. He wants to take from you everything that's good and everything that's of God. Look at Revelation 12, 12. It says, Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury 
because he knows that his time is short. The devil knows what's coming to him. And as one theologian once said, that Satan carries his chains around with him everywhere he goes. Listen, the devil knows he's on a short leash. And the devil knows that one day he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. And he knows there's nothing that he can do about this. It is written, and it is God Almighty who will cast him into the lake of fire. He knows his time is short. He's filled with fury. Why does he hate you? Because you are made in the image of God. He hates God, and therefore he hates you because you're made in the image of God, and he wants to destroy your life. He can't really hurt God, right? But he can hurt you, and that's how he wants to hurt God. He can't just go and punch God, but if he can hurt your life and he can destroy your life, he knows how much God cares about you. He knows how much God loves you, and so he comes to attack you and to try to ransack and destroy your life. But in terms of God, the devil's no match for God. Please put out of your mind this idea of dualism where God and Satan are kind of equal foes and that it's kind of a wrestling match. Please. Satan is no match for God. If it were a boxing match, it wouldn't go 15 rounds. It wouldn't go 10 rounds. It wouldn't go five rounds. They would, you know, hit the bell. Jesus would go over. One hit, he's out. It's over. You paid a lot of money to go see the match, but you didn't get to see much. He's no match for Jesus. He's cringing in fear here. Even in James 2.19, it says you believe in one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. They tremble at his name. They tremble at his sight. And, they, and, and demons want to kind of psych you out and make you think they're more powerful and, and that you would be afraid. A believer should never be afraid of the devil because by the authority of Jesus Christ, you can say, get behind me, Satan, and he has to get behind you. You have authority over the devil, not in your name, but in the name of Jesus. But that's the problem. This man was demon-possessed, possessed by multiple demons. Well, let's continue to talk about the power. Of course, it's the power of Jesus. No one else could help this man. I'm sure his family tried to help him. Could you imagine if you were the parents of this man? Knowing that your son has been excluded from society... Knowing that your son is living out among the tombs, he doesn't even wear clothing, he goes around naked, cuts and bruises all over him where he's tried to destroy himself. He's a wild man. He's like an animal. Everybody in the community knows about him. Everybody in the community talks about him. Could you imagine if you were the parents of this man? And how your heart would grieve and how you probably tried to get him any help that you could. And I think about parents and grandparents that will try to do everything they can to help their children, get them counseling, do whatever they can. You'll spend every dollar you have to help your children and your grandchildren, right? But there's only so much we can do. And there are certain cases only Jesus can set them free. Instead of spending out all the money, why don't you get down on your knees before God and pray to the only one that can make a difference? And that's Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what, being a parent will help your prayer life. And being a grandparent will help your prayer life. Because you seek the Lord for your children, your grandchildren. You say, Lord, I pray that you would help them. Notice verse 28, when Jesus came on the scene, they said, what have we to do? What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. They knew exactly who Jesus was. They knew his power. They said, do not torment me. They knew that they were no match for Jesus Christ. And this shows that Jesus was more than a teacher. He was more than a prophet. He was more than a good man. He was and is the son of the most high God. Look at Colossians 2, 9. 
For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. That's what we believe as Christians, that Jesus was fully God and fully human at the same time. One person with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. That's what we believe as Christians. And he had to be both to save us. If he weren't human, he would not be able to die as a sacrifice. If he weren't God, he would not be perfect and be able to overcome death. He had to be human and divine, and together in one body, in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, he is the one and only Savior. Amen. Why would you even worry about other religions? You're not going to find salvation in other religions. You're not going to find salvation in the world. There's salvation in one Jesus Christ, fully God, fully human. He's the only one that can set you free. Look at John 8, 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I like what Daryl Bach, he's a commentator on the Gospel of Luke, I like what he writes about this deliverance. He says, in a complete reversal of the previously possessed man's demeanor, he is now clothed, whereas before he had been naked. He is now seated, whereas before he had been roaming. He is now associating with others as he sits at Jesus' feet, whereas before he sought solitude. He is now of sound mind, whereas before he had been crying out in a loud voice. He is now comfortable in the presence of Jesus, whereas before he wanted nothing to do with him. That's the deliverance Jesus can bring. Amen. And you look at a situation, and, you, and we've all done this, that family member or that neighbor or that coworker or that person you went to high school with and you think there's no way God can help them, there's no way God can set them free. Yes, he can. Amen. Do you know anyone is in the worst condition as this? Please tell me. Do you? Do you know of anyone that's possessed by multiple demons, maybe up to 6,000 demons, naked, living among the tombs, isolated from society. Do, really, do, does any of you have a child or grandchild that meets this same condition? I don't think so. So what I'm saying is in this case, in this unbelievably hard and impossible case, if Jesus could set this man free, he can set any man free. Amen. Any man, any woman, he can do it. Jesus commanded the demons to leave this man, cast them out. Now they ask, send us into the pigs. All these pigs were nearby, and they begged him. They said, don't send us into the, to the abyss, a place of temp temporary confinement until the last day. Don't send us to the abyss. Send us into the pigs. And Jesus allowed them. By the way, this confirms what we already knew. It was a Gentile region. Because Jewish people didn't eat pork. There wouldn't be all these pigs around if it was a Jewish region. This shows it was a Gentile region. Again, this man was a Gentile. Jesus came for all people, but also by allowing the demons to leave the man and enter into the pigs. And what did they do? They went wild. They went over the cliff and they drowned. But that was tangible evidence that the demons had left the man and were gone for good. You could see the difference in the pigs, and so you knew that they had left the man. Tangible evidence of his deliverance. Let me ask you today, what evidence is there of your deliverance? You claim to be saved. You claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What evidence is there of your salvation? I remember when the Lord changed my life. And some of the changes that took place, I immediately had a love for the Bible. And I've never lost that love for God's Word. You know, a, a baby loves milk, right? I'm learning that a lot of babies like chocolate milk. <laughs> but children, they just love milk. It's just, they just, it's in them. If you're a Christian, 
you love the Word of God. How can you be a believer and not love the Word of God? It's in our nature to read the Word, to study the Word, and to digest the Word. That's tangible evidence that you're a believer in Jesus Christ if you have a love for the Bible. Also developed a love for God's people, love for the church, attending Sunday school, attending church services, just want to be with God's people. Whether it's in someone's home or at the actual campus, it didn't matter. I just want to be around God's people. I've never lost that love for God's people. And if you're here today and church is not something you want to be a part of and you're just kind of here because someone makes you be here, have you ever been saved? Because I'll tell you, when you're saved, you love God's people. And I stopped hanging around the wrong crowd when I became a Christian. Now, I didn't turn my back on all my friends, but I stopped living that lifestyle, and I stopped going to those places, and I stopped doing those things. And one of the reasons I see people who have been addicted to drugs and alcohol, and some of them go back, and one of the reasons is some of them keep hanging out with the old friends, and they influence them. And I had to make a decision. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. It was painful. I had friends that I had hung around for years and we no longer got together, and we no longer did things, and I had to start from scratch. And wow, God has blessed me. You wouldn't believe how many Facebook friends I have today. <laughs> but seriously, God has given me a lot of friends. And whatever, let me say this, whatever you give up to follow Jesus, he will bless you a hundredfold. Amen. Whatever it is. You say, oh, I can't give this up to follow the Lord. You do. He will bless you a hundredfold Amen. in this world and in the world to come. You can read it in the Bible. And then I began to pray for God's will to be done in my life. The, the day I was saved, September 23, 1990, that evening I was lying in my bed, and I thought, what have I done? <laughs> I'm a Christian now, and I knew it. God gloriously saved me. And I prayed that night. I just had this prayer. Lord, lead me down the straight and narrow. I knew there was a lot of changes coming. I knew God was going to turn my world upside down. But I said, Lord, lead me down the straight and narrow. Jesus set this man free. The demons came out of the man into the pigs. Tangible evidence that the demons had left and he was now a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you, what is the tangible evidence that you're a believer in Jesus Christ? If there's no evidence, then my friend, maybe there's no salvation. Acts 2.21 says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. Well, that's the power. One last thing, that's the proclamation. What I find so fascinating is these townspeople. Now, think about it. They had this problem on their hands, this man who was demon-possessed, that they had to basically put him away from society. And isn't that what we do even today? We can't help someone, so we just institutionalize them. Basically, that's what they did to this man. We can't help you. We're going to institutionalize you. We're just going to separate you from society. They could not help this man. They could not fix the problem. Finally, someone comes who can. He's now clothed, seated, and in his right mind, and it says... They were afraid. What? Afraid? You would think it, was, it would say, and they were filled with joy. And they were so glad they couldn't contain it. And they sang his praises. No, it says they were afraid. The power of Jesus caused them to fear. And they were more concerned about those pigs than they were this man. Oh, you've ruined our herd of pigs. We're not going to be able to eat bacon tomorrow. We're not going to be able to have ribs and pork sandwiches this season. They're more concerned about these pigs than they were the human being. Isn't that today? Now, I'm an animal lover. I have a dog. I've had that dog for 12 years. And uh, when she dies, that's going to be kind of hard on old Pastor Mark. But let me tell you, 
I love my wife more than I love that dog. And I love my son more than I love that dog. And I love my daughter more than I love that dog. And yet there are people today, I think they love their pets more than they love their spouses and they love their children and they love their family. <laughs> and we value animal life at times higher than human life or at least equal to human life. You all remember what happened to, at the Cincinnati Zoo a while back when that child somehow got into the gorilla exhibit? Could you imagine if you were a parent and your little, little four-year-old or five-year-old was in the gorilla exhibit and you're just powerless? What can you do? And the gorilla had that child and they did what the only thing they could do. They shot the gorilla and killed it instantly and went and saved the life of that little boy. And yet there were people. How could they take the life of this gorilla? This is a gorilla that had been here for years. This is a special kind of gorilla. And then they were mad at the parents and so forth and so on. And you wonder how a child that age could even get into an exhibit like that. But nevertheless, the gorilla or a boy. There's no, there's no choice. There's no decision. It's, it's so evident. It's a no-brainer. You kill the gorilla. And I love gorillas. I love going to the zoo. But I'm just telling you, when it's either or, you, human life Amen. is the pinnacle of God's creation. Amen. Just read Genesis 1 and 2. It says, as you go through Genesis 1, six times God's created. It was good, 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 it was good. And then he created male and female in his image. And then verse 31, it says, and it was very good. Animals are not made in the image of God. Animals cannot pray and have a personal relationship with God, but you can, and I can. We should value human life. Yes, we thank God for animals, and when we think about animals being extinct, all this should be important, but it's not most important. Human life is more important. And yet Jesus set him free. Let me tell you, he can set you free. Now, what's interesting is he's set free, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, I want to follow you. And you think Jesus would say, of course, come follow me. But remember, this is during his earthly ministry. He's ministering among the Jews, ministering in Palestine. It, it just wasn't the right time to have this Gentile following all the time. He knew what he needed at that point was to go. Jesus had to go back to Palestine. He needed a witness in that Gentile region. So what did he say to him? Verse 39, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Yeah. Now, I want you to look at your Bibles, if you have them here. In verse 39, red letters, Jesus speaking, return to your home and declare how much who has done for you? God has done for you. Read on. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. You know why? Because he was God in human flesh. And when you start bragging on Jesus, you're bragging on God. Because Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you.